So about six months ago, I finished my PhD at Georgia Tech, uh, where I studied music technology. And essentially what I did was I worked with new technologies that incorporated music for different types of applications. Um, I came out of the robotic musicianship group that was headed by uh, Dr. Gil Weinberg. And uh, most of my research and most of what I'm going to be talking about today has to do with artificial intelligence and getting robotics and computers to understand music and then to play and generate music and improvise. Um, so I just want to go over a first, some first things about uh, what I did during graduate school. Um, so one of the first projects that I ever worked on was sonification of, of data. Um, which is basically taking uh, a visual representation of some piece of some data and then re-representing it as audio so that we can listen to something that is visual. And so this was a project that we did at the Georgia Aquarium um, in Atlanta in the United States. And um, what you're seeing is they, uh, the image is being sonified, it's being turned into music so that people with a visual impairment um, can enjoy and experience the aquarium. So that was some uh, data-driven music that was generated by a computer autonomously. We collected data from both people playing and then um, people describing the, the scene in the aquarium, and then we got computers to create this mapping and generate music by itself. Um, another thing that I worked on was with musical robots, trying to get robots to understand music so that you could interact with your, your musical playlist that you might have on your computer through a human robotic interaction. Um, so one of those um, interactions was something that we developed called query by tapping or by clapping. And uh, essentially what it's doing is I can tap out a beat and then it goes through my playlist and tries to find something that's similar. Can you play Justin Bieber, Travis? Can you play disco? Let's hear it. So that was uh, a robot named Shimmy that we developed at Georgia Tech. And we uh, call it a robotic musical companion. And so you're interacting with your musical playlist in an entirely different way than you might with a keyboard and mouse or through your mobile phone. Um, and it will hopefully enhance your, uh, your listening experience. And you saw that it was moving its head and it had two speakers in the ears and you could always be in the stereo zone because it would, it would, uh, it would follow you. Um, and then the other big part of my research is actual live performance with robots. So this is something, I was actually invited to give a talk in Brazil a few years ago, and it never happened, but I had developed something for, for that particular talk. Um, but now I get to actually show what I worked on. And um, yeah, so this is a, a, a robot that's generating some improv improvised music given a pre-composed chord progression. 
Um, and they asked me to do it over this particular song. So that robot, it's name. Oh, thank you. So that's Shimon. And uh, Shimon was a big part of my research when I was at Georgia Tech. And uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about, or the rest of what I'm going to be talking about, has to do with the computational methods and the technology that goes into actually making a robotic musician. So first I'll talk about uh, how do you get things to understand music and to um, then play music, make the decisions to play the right notes using just a computer, and then what do you have to change in order to get it to play on a robot? So first, uh, let's talk about the concepts of creativity. And I like to think of what I do in sort of two broad uh, domains. The first is just broadly creative thinking. And I like to think of creative thinking as um, the ability to solve problems or to adapt to unforeseen scenarios. So, for example, things where you have path planning, you have to be able to solve, uh, create some path in order to get from point A to point B. Um, there's things like obstacle avoidance, so it's very relevant for self-driving cars. And then for, for today, where we have these smart devices all over the room, we need these devices to be able to adapt and understand the idiosyncrasies of individual users. So being able to problem solve and being able to think creatively is, a, is essential for, these, for the su success of all of these different applications. So the, the more probably traditional concept of computational crea creativity has to do with what we traditionally think as being creative applications. So things like music and art and poetry. Um, so creating those applications um, that allow computers or machines to, to uh, drive some of these innovations. So in terms of types of application, I think there's three properties that a creative application should have. And the first is it should be able to innovate, uh, create something new, or create uh, something that hasn't been heard or seen before. And that aspect of novelty is related to creativity. Um, so an example of that is automatic improvisation. So what you'll hear next is like a, a pianist, a, si a simulated pianist playing uh, improvising according to a, a given chord progression. So just the pianist was generated by the computer. Uh, the other instruments were, were all humans. Um, and then another thing that uh, a creative application should be able to do is interact with people. And the goal is through these interactions and through this paradigm of shared control that we are able to allow humans to explore new, new spaces in terms of art 
and artistic culture. Um, and by, by doing this, we allow humans to explore all of these new, um, these new technologies and adapt to what uh, these robots are doing and be able to share uh, in creativity, in a, in a shared creativity with them. So here's an example. So that was from a performance that we do with uh, Shimon and also Gil Weinberg on piano. And that's been actually something that we've been touring with all over the world. Uh, this particular uh, performance was in uh, Washington, D.C. at the Kennedy Center. And then the third aspect of applications that contain computational creativity or trace of creativity is that it should, be, it should enable individuals to be creative or not just enable, but also augment uh, their natural abilities so that they can explore creativity with new abilities. Uh, so this is an example with Jason Barnes, who's been a longtime collaborator with us. And uh, he lost his arm and we built a robotic drumming prosthesis for him that's able to listen to him and he's also able to control it. But there is some level of autonomy that allows the prosthetic to interact with him in a way that would never have been able, would never have been possible um, with, with just a, a regular human arm. So obviously, all of these applications that I've been developing, um, they incorporate both creative thinking because they're able to problem solve and uh, create something new, but also where I'm working in the traditionally thought of as creative space, which is music. So how do we actually do this? How do we get machines to understand music and then make the decisions to play the right notes and to, to respond to individuals? So I like to draw an, an analogy to language. And right now, um, we have smart devices that are able to understand human language and then behave in a particular way based off of uh, what the system perceives as uh, the relevant information that's being spoken. So in order to learn what's relevant, uh, we can take some examples of dialogue. You can see the one on my right is uh, more about sports and then the other one on the, on the left is about more relevant to politics so ideally what we're hoping to learn are these spaces these topics that are in the language so things about food sports um art politics uh that's what we want to we want to get these higher level concepts in the dialogue and to do that um we can train a neural network and the ultimate goal is to be able to represent these dialogues as in a way that a computer can understand. And so that sequence of numbers we call a vector. And when we uh, learn it with um, uh, a neural network, it's, it's known as the embedding or the semantic space in which was learned by the network. So we can do something um, very similar with music. Instead of putting language in, we can uh, put notes. And the idea is to learn the semantic space about music. So, what, so these higher level ideas uh, that are descriptive of music. Um, so that can be things like note density and harmony and tonal tension, all of these characteristics that, we're able, that, we're, that we want to glean from data. So what we do is we first put the music into a representation that the computer can understand. So on top, uh, it's basically just a time frequency representation of the music. 
And then we're projected into this small space called the embedding. And that space will hopefully capture meaningful numbers that we can use uh, to drive creative applications. So the process for doing that is to take uh, something like one bar or one measure of music, and then we train the network to predict the surrounding measures or the surrounding bars. And as it's, it's scanning across the music, and as it's doing that, it's learning and gaining uh, more information about, the, about what it thinks is important in the music. So if you think of all of these little dots, these yellow dots as, a, as one measure, what the neural network is doing is going through this sort of push-pull um, behavior in order to put things that it thinks are similar next to each other and things that are dissimilar far away. So it's trying to organize all of the, the musical data into a way that um, is semantically relevant according to musical principles. And it's doing this through this neural network learning. So right now you'll hear some examples of things that it thinks are similar. So it learned those four things were similar. Here's another example. So what it learned was uh, higher level things about the music. So one thing that it captured really well is rhythm. So the note density between the, uh, each measure. And then also uh, tonal center, so tonality. And it learned these concepts completely unsupervised. We didn't tell it what it was. Uh, it just looked at the data and figured out, okay, this is uh, when, when people think about music, when people perform or compose music, they're thinking about these particularly relevant uh, ideas, and it captured that in the learning. Um, so we can play another example. We're actually in this learn space, in the embedding. We can actually merge two, two or more um, uh, motifs or musical bars and then listen to the output. So at the very top of example one, you'll hear um, a first input, and then on the bottom, you'll hear the second input. And then it's going to linearly interpolate. So it's going to be like a mixture of the two. So you'll see it go from the first one and then slowly sonically merge into the second seed. And I'll play one more example. So you could really hear like in those middle ex examples and where it was 50-50, 50% 50, 50, uh, 50 of each uh, seed, that it's sort of pulling one way or the other and you hear the mixture of, the bo of both seeds. Um, and then we can also do other cool things where we can actually transfer the style of one um, musical measure onto uh, the context of another. So here's a, an example of style transfer based off of um, Mozart and then 
the uh, core changes of giant steps, uh, Coltrane's giant steps. So that was transferring, we can also merge two different solos. So this is the first solo. So those were um, using just computers to play it. And one of the other things that I really like in terms of computational activity and their um, and, and application's ability to express this is being able to interact with people. So we developed an application that involves me interacting with the computer in sort of a question answer paradigm. I say something and then it responds. And this paradigm is generated by merging the two uh, the, both the question and the answer, and then generating the response based off of that. And it's an application that actually I developed at Google during an internship called Deep Musical Dialogue. And uh, yeah, and here's the example. So, so that was just based off of merging. We can also explicitly train the system to perform question and answers. So on the top, we, trained, we collected a lot of data of two people doing that same interaction where someone plays something, and then the second person plays something in response that's complementary to what the first person did. And so from this training data, using those initial embeddings that were learned by the neural network, we can learn the types of transformations that people make when they're, when they're responding to a previous uh, question or a previous call. And those different types of transformations we can cluster using various computational methods and then apply them to, uh, a, to, to create a generative system. So here's an example of a call and response system that was specifically trained to perform call and response.
So th those uh, types of generative systems were based off of uh, trained data uh, given people, two people interacting in, the, uh, in a call and response paradigm. Uh, we can also use these embeddings to actually get it to improvise. So instead of just having to transform or play one measure at a time, we can get it to generate many, many measures and just continuously. And in order to do that, we use something called a recurrent neural network, where the, its output is fed back into its input and it uses that recurrent, and it does that recurrently to keep continuously generate new music. So what happens is based off of the initial uh, information or the initial seed that we give the network, it will generate different types of music because that initial input will change how the system behaves. So in this example, you're going to hear two different improvisations, one with a first seed and another with a completely different seed, and you'll hear the different behaviors of, um, in, in, in the improvisation. So in this example, it's the pianist that's improvising. Now here's the second version with a different seed. So you could hear the, the different behaviors and the different improvisations. So we were able to do lots of cool things in just a pure software application. Um, but I also do a lot of work in ro with robotics. And why would we want to move from a software application to a, a more robotic application where there's actually a, a physical entity that we're interacting with? Um, so when I started graduate school, the term robotic musicianship, uh, we sort of said that there was three benefits or three advantages that distinguished itself from just regular computer musicianship. Um, the first was that it's capable of generating acoustic sound, um, and that one's probably the most obvious. Uh, the second is uh, the visual cues that you get uh, when you're interacting with a robotic musician. Uh, when a, when a, two humans are interacting, we're not just using our ears, we're using all of our senses, especially our our eyes in order to anticipate what's going to happen or to communicate some underlying information. And we use that, uh, th those important visual cues can come in um, to be, uh, have a really positive effect on uh, the, the interaction. And also from the audience perspective, it makes the, uh, the performance uh, quite a bit more engaging. And then the third thing was gestural communication. So not only are we getting the, nat the natural physics from the visual cues of actually actuating the individual notes, we can also use higher level gestures. So for the example, in Shimon has a head, and the reason that Shimon has a head is that it, it can communicate its underlying computational processes to other interactive musicians. It can show that it's uh, understanding uh, rhythm or the beat in the music, and then it can also show me when it's improvising or when it's listening. And so all of this, these, um, this information can be communicated gesturally. So those were the three big things that um, we thought were important when, uh, when I first started in graduate school and that we were exploring. Um, for my thesis, I was thinking, okay, those things are, are, are really interesting and do definitely distinguish itself from machine, regular machine musicianship. But there's also this entirely other portion that wasn't explored. And that was actually, how do the bodies themselves affect the music? So in terms of cognition, uh, there's this disconnectionist theory that says our bodies serve as the interface to the physical world, that we have a mind and it's separate from our body. And that's basically how we were developing for Shimon. But recently, uh, there's been a lot of um, excitement in this concept of embodied cognition. 
And embodied cognition states that the mind and the body are not separated, but they're sort of act as a simple computational entity. And so that we use our bodies to actually perceive and to make decisions because all of our decisions are grounded in something that's gonna have an effect on the physical world. So this idea of embodied cognition, um, we have, in terms of robotic musicianship, it means that the system is actually simulating what to play based off, its own, based off of its own physical constraints. And robotic musicians can be designed in a way that are completely different or completely unique from a human body. So it can't just give it human data and expect it to play something. We have to get, let it adapt to its own physical bodies. And then we can also explore different types of physical restrictions and different types of physical constraints on how the, the robot generates and perceives information. So an example of how it can affect the perception, uh, how it, bodies can affect our uh, a robot's perception of music is, is next. And um, basically what happens is the robot listens and then it moves according to what it thinks is important. So the way that it moved, it wasn't just dancing to, uh, it wasn't just listening to the music, it was also thinking about its physical self and then trying to move in a, in a way that optimizes for its physical body. And so the interesting thing is that people interact with their instruments very differently based off of the type of interface or inter uh, that their instrument provides. And uh, so something like a guitar or a trumpet piano, they're all different, they're very different interfaces and people have different bodies. And so we have to, we're doing the same thing. We're, we're adapting and planning according to these interfaces. So I like to give an example of, uh, these three musicians who um, adapted to their musical instrument and they weren't able to just uh, watch other people and learn from others because they had a, a physical constraint on them. Um, the, the first demo is uh, Django Reinhardt, a great guitarist, and um, he actually had, a, his hand was left disfigured and uh, slightly paralyzed and so he developed in a completely new way of interacting with the, uh, the guitar and playing his instrument, which was actually turned out to be quite revolutionary and really inspired um, lots of different types of uh, um, styles to, to be born out of what he was able to do. So you can see that he's just using a couple fingers because his other ones were paralyzed. So the way that he's playing the instrument He's doing different things. He's doing things that you wouldn't ordinarily see a guitarist do, but he's still able to produce great music. So what these people are doing are essentially something called path planning. They're considering the, the constraints of their physical body, and they have a goal, and they're and they're trying to create a sequence of movements or a sequence of um, tasks that allows them to achieve this goal. And so it's very similar to what we're doing in robots, in robotics. Um, so not only does a robot have to understand itself, its physical self, but then it has to have the, the proper decision-making processes that allows its physical self to get from point A to point B. So that could be any sort of task like picking up an object, throwing an object, uh, get, a self-driving car getting from one place to another, um, all of these things entail aspects of path planning that are incorporated into our physical um, embodied cog cognitive approach to generative music. 
So with Shimon, we have, uh, Shimon has four different arms. And so what Shimon is trying to do is trying to find uh, the path that allows it to play all of the notes according to these physical constraints. So it's going through all of these sets of uh, physical positions and then tries to find the optimal path that allows it to play a set of notes. Um, and so if we give it a pre-composed set of notes, um, we can see that with planning, the output is much, much better. Um, so here's an example. So this first part is with uh, very little planning. And here's with path planning. able to get not all but most of the notes when it's actually planning according to its own physical body. So that's a, a, a very common problem in terms of robotics and the next step, so here it was just playing pre-composed notes, notes that we gave it prior to actually playing. Um, the next thing we can do is we can have it generate its own notes based off of some higher musical, higher level musical concepts and that these concepts might think, be things like uh, pitch contour, tension, note density. Um, and what, we're trying, what the robot is trying to do is pick the sequence of notes that optimizes across all of these concepts. Um, so first, I'll play an example where um, the, the system is simulated and uh, it plays according to a, a set of physical constraints that are very similar to a human. So the next thing I'll show is a simulated improvisation over the same song and the same higher level musical concepts, but with a system that is extremely capable. So that the first one was representative of a human. It's not outside of the possibility of a human to perform, but the next one is with something that's quite capable. And you can see here that overall, everything looks pretty similar in terms of the the notes and the style that it's playing in this zoomed out bird's eye view, but the actual notes and the decisions it makes are quite different.
So you can see that if a computer knows that it, if, if a computer doesn't know that it's capable of doing something, it's not going to do it. So we have to give it that information so that it can explore new domains. And we want these domains to be things that are not humanly possible because we want to expand artistic culture and, uh, and even human culture and, and understand what is possible. What sort of art can we create based off of um, human knowledge of music, but physically capable machines. So here's an example of actually of that system applied on the robot where the system where the robot is generating new improvisation, a new improvisation based off of um, that embodied cognitive system. So for those improvisations, we were giving the robot goals that we designed by hand. Us as musicians, we were able to decipher what is important in music. What do we think that a robot should capture when it's generating its own piece or its own improvisation? But remember, at first, um, the neural network was actually able to, to learn all of these concepts. So we can actually use the concepts that the neural network learns and create uh, in a, a new composition based, because that's completely autonomous without any human input. So instead of using those hand-coded or, or hand-designed um, contours or, and musical features, we can let the robot pick from these units of measures based off of what it's capable of playing and then generating a new composition from there. So the last video I'll show is uh, a piece by Shimon, which was completely generated by the computer and uh, without any human input. The only human input was the seed to get it started. We just said, okay, here's your first two measures. Now go from there. So that was Shimon generating an entirely new composition based off of deep learning technology. So I just, uh, before I take questions, I just want to thank my advisor, Gil Weinberg, who's the uh, director of the Center for Music Technology at Georgia Tech. And then also uh, Larry Heck and Sagiv Orr, who I, I worked with both at Google. And um, now actually I'm a, research engineer at Samsung, and, and Larry is also there, and he's my current boss. And the things that we're doing at Samsung are building off of all of these concepts in terms of computational creativity and trying to get machines to be creative and to explore these new domains of machine learning and uh, creativity and understanding how people might be creative and understanding human cognition, and then applying that to machines to get machines to be creative. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions now.
Is it working? Yeah, it's now. Okay, so thanks a lot for the presentation. I love it. The field is really interesting. I'm particularly impressed by that. And I would like to ask you if it's a growing field. I've never seen anything before about uh, robots that are creative enough to create music, improvise, and there are some super amazing tens that are created by Joe Coltrane and music's pretty mathematical, but at the same time, it's pretty much about creativity. So I'd like to know if you were the only one doing research about that, if, or if at Georgia Tech, you were doing research on that, how is it working? Yeah, so, so actually computer generated music is something that has been around, around since computers have been around. So it's something that's, that's not a new concept. Um, ro ro robotic musicianship is more new. Uh, something that's, well, some, where, where you have this underlying artificial intelligence driving the, the notes, uh, that's relatively new uh, in terms of getting um, a robot to play. But there are several research labs that, that do this around the world. Um, uh, yeah, I had one slide that showed all the different pictures of robotic musicians or musical robots. Uh, that are capable of playing. And so some people have uh, different research expertise. Uh, some people focus more on the mechanics and getting things to actuate sound in a way that sounds good. Um, because people, like if you were to strike a drum, there's so many ways to do it and there's all of these subtleties. Uh, it's very hard to capture all of that and get a, a machine to be expressive. Um, my research uh, is more on the generating the notes uh, side of things. So once that we have uh, the hardware in place, then getting things to, to learn and you apply AI techniques and machine learning and then make decisions from there. Here. Hello. Hi. Uh, I would like to ask about how does this kind of research goes from music to other kinds of art? And if there's research on that and how it's going? Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's a lot of uh, research in, in vision related and, and visual art. Um, and especially now that uh, deep learning and machine learning has really taken off, we see lots of uh, computer generated images that are able to mix two different uh, images and create something new. Um, but there's been also a lot of applications previously that allow people to uh, be creative. So, so things like Photoshop, uh, they give people the, the tools and then people can use those tools and apply them to something, uh, to their own art. And um, here, uh, we're making tools, but then the computer is also using those tools to make its own art. Um, so in general, uh, computational creativity is a, is a fairly big field. There's several academic conferences and there's a lot of uh, research groups, even in industry uh, that like, so I'm at Samsung, there's also other groups at uh, Google and Microsoft that are doing all of these great things uh, in terms of understanding uh, human creativity and then getting machines to do this. Um, uh, I'd like to know if instead of uh, giving the robot uh, bars of scores and read the information if you could give audio input for it to understand it and try to create something from that. Yeah, so, so that, so, so I guess um, you can think of it as a sort of hierarchical process. So at the very, very bottom is the pure audio signal, like what, what, we do, what we have when we're listening to musicians play. And having a computer just use that information is, is now actually, we're just seeing to start to start to see um, some success learning from that level. And uh, it's, it's very, very challenging. Uh, most of uh, the concepts that we are, were trying to, to give the robot weren't using uh, that low level audio, but they were at the representational side. Um, and so we're trying to, we made the assumption that it has these compositions already in hand and it doesn't have to do the, the pitch tracking or the polyphonic pitch discrimination. Um, but it's something uh, that is an active research area. And uh, I think in, in the near future, we're gonna be seeing a lot of progress in that domain. Here, hello. Thank you for the talk. Uh, how long do you think it's gonna take to the robots to desire 
to create a whole new set of musical instruments for the, of their own? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so so what, why, one of the, the challenges with, with robots, and especially social robots, is that uh, we're giving it all of this explicit information and we're just telling it to uh, do something with it, essentially. Create a model based off of this. But it has really no other internal goals or desires. And so uh, getting a, a, a computer or a robot to have these desires to, to want to generate music and uh, create new art is, is a really fascinating idea, but something I, th I think we're still uh, a little bit far away from. And uh, we don't even quite understand why, why we have some of these desires and what drives us to make, make art. Um, so replicating that with a machine is, is it's probably possible. I'd like to. I'd like to think it's possible that we can have uh, completely creative machines, um, but I think we're still a little ways off from from seeing that. Actually, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, it's, more, it's more about sci-fi than really science. But do you think there's where's the limit where the self-learning process will go? Like. We have machines controlling the world, or we have just machines that will help us to our regular tasks and stuff. So, so right now, uh, things like machine learning have do really well when we explicitly give it uh, the information and tell it what to learn. Um, but there are signs now that show that it can learn unsupervised, without without a lot of uh, explicit information being told about what's important. Um, so, so having computers uh, learn and have it learn something that's not really intended by the developer is definitely some, it's something that happens all the time, especially now with, with research. Um, so it's something uh, when, when we're designing our neural networks and stuff, we, want, we usually have some desire about what we want the system to learn. Um, and it doesn't always work out that way. And right now, it's easy enough for us to just stop the computer from continuing to learn in a direction that we don't want it to. But it's something uh, that might be worrisome in, in the future, um, where you, we have these systems that are learning and we don't exactly uh, want it to learn something that's uh, sort of inhumane. Hi. Uh, that is in in ethical discussion about this. Uh, say one more time. That is in ethical discussion about this. Ethical. Oh, ethical. Uh, unethical about this. So a lot of people ask me th this question about like whether or not I'm trying to take people's jobs and uh, create systems that are you know will replace people, um, and that's absolutely not the the goal. Um, in term, so so actually, I, I, I think I, I think when, when people make have that question or, or, or think that that's what we're doing, I think they they don't think very highly of people because people I think are extremely creative, and to be concerned that machines are going to be cre more creative than people and have that as a worry or a concern, I don't think uh, I don't think it should really exist because people they're going to see this new technology and they're going to take advantage of it in ways that we have, we've never seen before, we have no idea what they're going to be able to do with it. Um, so in a way, I think we're expanding human artistic and musical culture and giving people the tools and the technology to explore these different domains, I think it's really exciting and definitely not unethical. Okay, thank you very much.